Power 98.7 Podcast. If it's happening in your country or around the world, Power 98.7 is your eyes and ears. Now we're talking. Now we are talking. Eric Olanda is joining us on the line. He's the co-host of a weekly China in Africa podcast and co-founder of the China Africa Project. The question is, is China a partner or a predator in Africa? Depending on who you are speaking to, uh, China's engagement in Africa is almost described in, 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 in all sorts of extreme terms. And as, as you're, you're hearing from um, uh, one of our listeners, Sharon Nipa, saying they are predators. Man. They do the most, they violate uh, humans' uh, 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 in the most grossest way possible, uh, they destroy small economies. They, 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 they are just predators, as far as Sharon is concerned. But what's your thought? Uh, what's your opinion on it? Oh eight six one nine eight seven triple zero. Eric, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Tabo. Thank you for having me on the show. We appreciate it. it stretch our minds a little bit. We've been talking about uh, BRICS, and we are we are we are saying well, BRICS could be could possibly be a, a good thing. We were talking about rating agencies not so long ago here in South Africa, and people are saying well, uh, we we need our own BRICS um, 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 uh, agencies to come in and 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 score us because these other ones from the Western world are not really for us. And people are saying no, let's have a BRICS bank. Uh, and and the reason why the rating agencies actually are set with us is because we are talking about the BRICS Bank, uh, which includes China. I mean, is, is yeah. China good for Africa? You know, I can sit here for the next hour and I can tell you with a straight face that China is the worst thing that's ever happened to Africa since colonization. I can also sit here for the next hour mm. and tell you with a straight face that China is the best thing that's ever happened to Africa. And both would be true. So the key here is understanding the differences between kind of the extreme. You talked about the extremes. And when people kind of get locked into the extremes of it's the worst thing, it's the best thing, they lose that important middle because it's a lot of both. The question of human rights violations, I mean, how, 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 what's the veracity of those claims? So here's the, here's the thing. And, and again, I'm not Chinese. I don't have a horse in the race. I don't support the Chinese. I'm just a journalist covering the story. I think it's important to make that. And I, I make that declaration because a lot of people, when they hear a defense of the Chinese, they say, oh, you must be a communist. You must be a pro-Chinese, a panda hugger. So let me just put that out there. That, But people have different definitions of human rights in different parts of the world. And the definition of human rights in China, and this is very important for Africa as well, is that civil and political rights are secondary to a full belly mm. of food, to a roof over your head, to mm. clothes on your back, mm. to an education. Mm. Social and, and economic rights are the most important for the Chinese. Mm. And what you can see over the past 30 years, what China has done, is they have educated more people in a shorter period of time than any other country in human history. Mm. They've moved more people from below poverty to above subsistence in a shorter period of time than any other country in human history. We're talking six, seven, eight hundred million people, the entire population of the continent of Africa in one generation went from below subsistence to above subsistence to becoming this world's second largest economic power. So that deserves an enormous amount of praise. So when we talk about human rights, we have to be very clear about what rights are we talking about. Now, I will not sit here and defend the Chinese on political rights and the egregious human rights violations that they commit uh, in, in certain parts of their country. And the fact that the Chinese have spent more money on internal state security than even their army and their foreign defense mm. shows you the insecurity that this government has. Mm. But again, we have to be very, very clear when we're talking about the Chinese mm. that there are incredible positive stories mm. side by side with shocking, horrific stories as well. Mm. Mm. So again, this is too complex. This is one fifth of humanity. You know, human beings are very complex creatures. And if we get locked into the binary, good, bad, good, bad, yeah. we lose the nuance that is yeah. so important. The, the critics will tell you also about the, 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 the low-cost Chinese imports that come in and yeah. they kill uh, local e economies. I mean, what, what is the negative consequence of, of, of China bringing its, its low-cost products in, into uh, African economies in particular? But, you know, Africa here is part of the global economy. And what's very interesting is you saw the election of Donald Trump in the United States complaining about the same thing. What are they complaining about in Eastern and, and, and Western Europe? The same thing. Chinese companies and Chinese low-cost imports are killing jobs. So there are two sides to the story of Chinese imports. One is on the jobs front, and you are right. There's something called the China price, mm. which is that every manufacturer has to meet the China price because it's cheaper to produce in China or Vietnam or somewhere else like that. 
And so in, in, in Nigeria, in Kano, they're, they're struggling because the textiles now are coming in from China and destroying the entire northern Nigerian textile industry because people can't compete. In Egypt, the same way. In South Africa, there are so many new products coming in from China. Go to any of the big shops and everything's made in China. So on the one hand, yes, that does put jobs pressure on South African employers, mm. which is terrible for employees as well because mm. a lot of people are losing their jobs. Yeah. But again, let me, let, me, let me paint you a different part of this story. Consumers are benefiting enormously from lower prices, more diverse goods, in some cases higher quality goods. You know, people think of Chinese products as being cheap and low quality. Yeah. Yes, a lot of them are, there's no doubt. Mm. But remember, iPhones are made in China. Mm. You know, I mean, you know, computers are made in China. The Chinese will build products at any level depending on what the market will pay for them. Mm. So there's quality, very, very high quality products. I, I'm using my MacBook Air. Guess what? That was made in China. Yeah. My TV from Samsung made in China. Yeah. So there's good products made in China and there's bad products made in China. Mm. But the, the consumers are benefiting from lower prices. And that's a very important part in Africa, particularly in South Africa, where disposable income oftentimes is very limited. Yeah. So a consumer's spending power can go up because of these, yeah. these lower prices. Yeah. Again, it's terrible for employers and employees. Yeah. Why do African countries prefer to look east? I mean, uh, except for the fact that you're saying money is drying up in the West and therefore they, they, they are probably the, 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 the only option that African countries or African governments in particular have in terms of funding big infrastructure projects. Well, there are, you know, Africa's 54 countries. Everybody's got their own agenda. So let's, we'll, we'll kind of look, we'll, we'll look at the broad stroke, strokes of it. But there is this sense of fatigue in dealing with the West. There is this sense of fatigue that a trillion dollars of foreign aid in the past 50 years has done nothing. There's a sense of fatigue that when people like President Barack Obama come to Kenya and start lecturing the Kenyans on human rights, start lecturing Kenyans on, on gay rights, start lecturing Kenyans on all sorts of different things, and American ambassadors and American uh, you, you know, diplomats for, for generations now have been lecturing Africans on what they should do. In fact, now it's interesting because the West themselves are not doing the very things that they've been lecturing the Africans to do for the past 50 years. So all of a sudden, this, this sense of fatigue just finally just says, you know, enough. And then there's this new power on the block in the past 10 years that comes up and says, we're not going to lecture you. We're not going to get involved in your domestic affairs. You know what? If you want to be a dictator like Mr. Mugabe and you want to violate the civil and human rights of your people, you know what? We ain't going to get involved in that. If you want to build infrastructure, we'll build infrastructure, but we're not going to focus on civil and political rights. We're also not going to play the aid game the same way that's been played because the Chinese looked at the aid game and they said, you know what? It's not working. And mm. I think everybody agrees that the aid business is a business first mm. and aid second. Mm. And aid has not worked. And the Chinese, they, they take great pride in their own economic development because – they became the world's second largest economy, not on the backs of aid, but on the backs of entrepreneurialism. Mm. They had some aid from the Japanese to get started, but the past 25 years was land reform, agricultural reform, was market reform, was you know all of these different things that unleashed the power of the Chinese entrepreneur to, to, to sell and to start businesses. And so they look at the aid business themselves as a broken Western model. So they came in and they didn't start lecturing African governments about, here's what you should do. Now, it's interesting because they're now starting to do that. You know, and that's so where it's very interesting how the shoes on the other foot, we're starting to see Chinese propaganda and Chinese media kind of saying, well, you Africans should be more like us. And you're just like, oh, gosh, you know, you guys were off to a good start, but it's starting to kind of get a little bit kind of hypocritical now. But <laughs> for the most part, yeah. African governments really love this, what's called the no strings attached yeah. policy, yeah. which is that money would be given to African governments without any strings, without any intervention, without any moralizing and lecturing. Yeah. And that was very welcome in Africa. So should, should the West then be, I mean, what should be their narrative? Should they be fearing the role of China in Africa because of, 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 of that particular approach? Uh, or or uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it fair game? Is it, fair, is, it, is it a fair game that they're taking? It, it, it's, it's different because the West, you know, is very confused about Africa because the mindset is still of the, of the average person in the West is one that Africa remains the basket case. Africa is the case of famine, war, AIDS, rape, violence, Ebola. You know, that's what the average person in the United States and Europe thinks of Africa. It's mm. a dangerous place. Mm. And, and Africa and uh, Western governments are confused because on the one hand, they hear this Africa rising narrative 
They hear this idea that some of the fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. They need to get involved, but they can't motivate their companies to get there. They can't mobilize the aid because, you know, in Europe and in the United States now, there is no tolerance for aid. In fact, we're looking the other direction. These are kind of more xenophobic, more isolationist, more inward looking countries now in the West. So the idea of aid is something that may actually go away from the West. I mean, I really believe that Donald Trump will cut a significant portion of American aid to Africa. And I think in Europe, there's not a lot of, you know, you know, Europeans are fed up now with Africans coming across into their shores as my, as the migrant crisis really intensifies. And so they feel like we're taking care of millions of African and Middle Eastern migrants at, here at home. Why am I spending billions of dollars to send it to Africa too? Yeah. So the politics of aid are changing very quickly. So are they worried? Yes. Do they know what to do? No. And what's amazing when you talk to American politicians and Western European politicians, we're about 10 years into China's surging engagement in Africa, and the lack of sophistication about it is shocking. Mm. I mean, shocking. I have, and I'm not exaggerating, I regularly have U.S. diplomats and U.S. intelligence agents kind of ping me up and say, can I talk to you? And I think to myself, here I am just a blogger. I'm a guy who sits in his bedroom and does a podcast, and I've got the world's most powerful intelligence agency asking me <laughs> about the Chinese in Africa. I mean, it, it's, you wouldn't believe it if I told yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. But, that, yeah. but again, the level of ignorance is stunning, yeah. and it remains – and they're not learning fast enough. And I think that's what's, what, what's a key thing here is there's a major geopolitical shift that's underway for better or for worse, yeah. okay? Yeah. But it's happening, yeah. and that between China and – uh, in Africa. And today, you know, I just published my latest post is the fact that because Donald Trump, six weeks into office now, has not said the word Africa once, mm. not once have we heard anything about Africa. Now, you Africans may be very relieved considering what Donald Trump has been doing with Sweden and with Australia and with Mexico. Yeah. But the fact is that it looks like there's a policy vacuum coming from the Americans. Yeah. And that's going to give the Chinese a very big opening in Africa even more. So Chinese don't see themselves as colonialists, but what is their position on neo-colonialism? And, 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 and should, Listen, should, should, should Africans um, be concerned about their growing influence uh, in, in, in their countries? I think it's so important that we banish the word colonialism from this discussion. Colonialism was a 20th, pre-20th century invention. Mm. The Chinese in Africa are a 21st century phenomenon. So number one, let's start with about how the Chinese view themselves. Let's not forget that you and Chinese people have something very important in common. You were both the victims of European and Japanese colonialism. Well, the, you're not the Japanese, but European colonialism. Mm. The Europeans colonized Africa, or China just as they colonized Africa. Mm. They, they carved up, they, they forced opium into, into southern China. They created unfair treaties. They were not any nicer in China as they were in Africa. So there is a bond that you should have between the two victims of European colonialism. And then on top of it, the Chinese were colonized by the Japanese as well, mm -hmm. violently and brutally. So the Chinese, you know, they have that memory and they say, we are, we'll never be that way. Now, when, when people say and accuse the Chinese of colonizing Africa, and we hear this a lot, neo-colonialism, neo it disrespects the memory of the violence of what happened under colonialism. To compare what the Chinese are doing today to what the Belgians did in the Congo or what the British did in South Africa or what the Germans did in Zambia is, to me, a disrespect to the ancestors who suffered under European colonialism. That is not to say what the Chinese are doing is honorable all the time. Mm. It's not to say what they're doing isn't necessarily illegal, corrupt, but it's not colonialism. And I think we owe it to, the, to history to not disrespect that word and also to understand that the Chinese are using the tools of globalization and global capitalism to come into Africa. They're not stealing the resources the way the British did. Yeah. They're not forcing well, look, the Ch 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 to wear China, is, China is still looking out for China, though, ultimately. Of they're seeking, they are seeking opportunities oh, not for, for, hey. for anything else but for China. Yeah, you know, as countries do, all countries behave in their own national self-interest. There's no two ways about it. China looks at Africa as a way to promote its own self-interest, just the same way it looks at South America and the same way that it looks at every country. How can it best? Now, the good news for you is that China sees the benefits of spending hundreds of billions of its taxpayers' money to develop infrastructure in Africa. Now, a lot of that is through loans, so you'll have to pay that back, yeah. but a lot of it isn't. And you remember that there are more poor people in China than there are in Africa. Mm, 
Mm. Remember that. Mm. So it doesn't go down very well with Chinese taxpayers that so much of their money is going to Africa. So mm. this is a political risk for the, uh, for the Chinese because China is not a rich country. It is the second largest economy. So China is rich, but Chinese are not. And that's something that's very, very important. I think a lot of Africans, they look at China as the same as, say, Japan or the West, and it's not. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of people live in poverty in China. Yeah. So when you see that Chinese construction road being built with, with grants and loans from the Chinese, mm. take into account that a lot of people back in China are like, wait, what? Why are we building over there when our home is suffering here? Mm. So just something to think about. So that helps influence the way that the Chinese see this is they are using global capitalism. They're buying up the oil. They're buying up the minerals. That is very, very different yeah. than stealing. Yeah. Now, here's the problem, though, very quickly, is they, the money, and this is where people kind of come down, and they're right. The Chinese are doing business in Africa, but they're doing business with people like Joseph Kabila. Mm -hmm. And the money stays with Joseph Kabila and goes into his pocket in the Congo and Kinshasa, and it doesn't make it down to the people. The Chinese have a preference for dealing with elites, and for dealing with states. So always, so people see, wow, the Chinese are spending so much, but I don't benefit. And that's a fair criticism. In the long term, um, um, uh, have, they're having interests in, in establishments in Africa, like factories. I mean, South Africa is going uh, this, this industrialization route, and we are talking a lot about that. And we are seeing a lot of these factories popping up, and all these factories are Chinese-owned. People are saying, in the long term, is that really going to be of benefit for South Africa. Okay. Here's, you have two choices to kind of think about this issue. Are you worried about too much Chinese coming in, too much Chinese money coming in, or should you be more concerned about not enough? Now, here's the reason why I say that. Africa represents less than 4% of China's global trade. So that is the equivalent of finding a little bit of money in your sofa. It's insignificant. If Africa disappears from China, from the world tomorrow for China for trade, doesn't matter. They wake up the next day, they say 4%'s gone. That's not so bad. Mm. So here's the bigger concern that I, that I kind of put out to people. Well, while people in Africa worry about too much Chinese money, you need to be also worried that that money comes home again. You need to be worried that the Chinese lose interest in Africa because what happens when Chinese investment flows and Chinese aid and Chinese development money and infrastructure money dries up because the Chinese, you know what? They see South America now as a more important you know, area. Remember that South America and the Americas have a third more trade with China than all of Africa. Mm. All of Africa has less trade with China than Australia. Huh. So I think a little bit of humility needs to be injected into the conversation about where is the concern? Too much or ultimately maybe too little? We saw investment last year in the mid the Chinese economic downturn drop by 40%. 40% Chinese sell of Chinese investment. So what happens if the factories, the Beijing Automotive Works factories in Elizabeth, Port Elizabeth, the Hisense factories, what happens if they go home? And they might. Don't, you know, the economy gets bad enough, they pack up and they go. In this world of globalization, there is no, nothing written that the Chinese have to stay, A, mm. in South Africa or B, in Africa. Mm. They can pack up and go home anytime they want. So I think we need to be a little bit more strategic in how we evaluate this because in globalization today, things move very, very fast and can be very, very destructive very quickly. Let me take a call in. Kromke, we've got Kitty Boni. Good morning. Morning, bro. boss. Yeah. How are you? Welcome. <laughs> Great. Mm. I want to ask your guest, and Moni, you'll get to your guest as well. Mm. I want to ask your guest that, look, should we as Africans worry about Donald Trump, whether he's thinking about us or even mentioning us in his narrative since he took over, or should we also worry so much about China? Is it possible, or it is not, that we African can depend on ourselves? Should we depend on other people? Is, it, is, it, is there a possibility that we can cut this dependency syndrome from the Western and the Eastern bloc? Because we've got Tell the resources me, here. Let me ask you a question. What does depend on yourselves mean? In a world, no country right now except North Korea and possibly Cuba depend on themselves because they're cut off from, the glo from, the, from, from globalization. But are you talking of what do you mean when you because I hear this quite a bit in your words. What do you mean when you say depend on ourselves to what? produce, to produce and to look after ourselves, to create factories or uh, service factories for ourselves, to, to, to consume almost 80 percent of the goods that we consume. 
within within the within the the, the, the continent, and maybe uh, 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 take out of the country maybe twenty percent, but eighty percent of the goods that we produce, we Africans must consume. That is depending on ourselves. Okay, so nothing will happen. Nothing can happen until governance in Africa gets better, until we see an end of corruption, until we see an end of, uh, of leaders serving their, their families, their tribes, and their self-interest first before their people. So it's really nice to hear that Africans want to take care of Africans first, but at the end of the day, that pressure should not be directed towards China or the West. It should be directed towards your own leaders. And you look at countries here in Asia, you look at Singapore, which was nothing but a swamp, no natural resources, Taiwan the same way, Hong Kong, which was a pile of rocks. And what they've managed to do with that through good governance and clean government has been incredible. And so I think the key question is not whether there should be dependency on the West or China, but what are you going to do to clean up your own governments first? Because once you have good government, anything is possible. But Ch- you see, can start problem, building. You can reform. The, Ch- the Chinese investment doesn't care about the rule of law. In fact, that's the, right. the, the, the claim is that they, they would rather invest in poor rule of law countries than in, in, in countries where there is rule of law. No, no, that's not necessarily true, in part because you see South Africa, which has the strongest rule of law in Africa, is now becoming the major hub for Chinese investment in Africa. Mm. In fact, the Chinese prefer to have, I mean, you look around the world where the Chinese invest the most money. It's in Europe, it's in the United States, it's in places where actually have quite strong rule of law. Now, the Chinese, again, they're global players. They know how to play both in weak rule of law environments, like they're very heavy investors in the DR Congo, they're investors in the Sudans. So they know how to play in places which don't have rule of law. But at the end of the day, I think they're like most people. They prefer to have the shelter of law. Uh, and, and, you know, they take advantage of that to protect now more and more their own intellectual property. So companies like Huawei, ZTE, you know, Lenovo, they don't want people stealing their ideas. So they'll use the courts to go after that. They like to be able to move their money around in banks that have good banking, strong banking systems. So Standard Bank in uh, in, in South Africa is a very important partner of the Chinese. So I think, you know, strong legal and financial systems benefit the Chinese more than weak ones do. Kiriboni, final bite? My final bite, Mr. Mazzulli. Mm. A challenge has been posed to us, which I agree with uh, most. We need to clean up our government and do away with this political monarch, with monarchy. We don't want to rule or govern by a, polit- a, 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 a political monarchy here. I think that is a problem with Africa, and I agree wholeheartedly with your, your guest. We need to clean up our government. Thank you. Kiriboni, appreciate it. There in Kromkeil on Twitter, Skumbuza saying it's the People's Republic of China, not a democracy. What the state has belongs to the Chinese people. Eric? Yeah, it is not a democracy, uh, even though it's funny because you look at the Chinese constitution, and they call themselves a democracy. But again, just like the idea of human rights, they have a very different definition than what we do in, in the rest of the world, both in Africa and the West, which is, again, we look at democracy as civil and political rights, and, and they don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, you know, North Korea is called the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. I mean, it's not democratic. It's, it's, it's you know, so, so the word democracy is, is not a universal understanding. Um, but they define political the human rights in a very, very different way. And what you'll find is the vast majority of Chinese tend to agree and support the Chinese definition. It's not because they're brainwashed. It's not because there's some kind of camp that they all go to. But they themselves see that a full belly, food, food on your plate, roof over your shoulder, you know, getting good education, all of those socioeconomic rights have a lot of meaning. And they look at countries like, you know, the United States, which, you know, has full democracy, supposedly, and but yet still has significant amounts of poor people. Forty percent of American children are in poverty. So oh, I'm sorry, 40 percent of the of, of the poor are children. Mm. And, and they look at that and they go, that's on that's not the, the country that they want, the society mm. that they want. Mm. Uh, they look at India and they say India is a democratic country, but you know, terribly, terribly poor. Mm. So would you rather have stability and less human rights or would you rather have, you know, instability and more human rights? Mm. That's a question that a lot of people wrestle with and there's no easy answer to it. There is no easy answer. KG is in Centurion. KG, good morning. Uh, Mr. Maduli, how are you? Well, man, how are you? Hey, I'm under the cold, but I'll be okay one day. Yeah, it is weather, like, man. Change, change, change of season. It's change of season. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's going to be okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, Mr. Mbul, let me just get into it. You know? mm. uh, let me just say uh, it, it can't be that we have a country that invests in our country that doesn't care about us just because it brings money or investment. And I wanted to ask because I live in South Africa and I'm exposed to this Chinese investment. Mm. But I need to ask your your guest, who does this investment benefit according to him? I, I'm not talking about uh, the, the, the talk. I'm talking about the real benefit. Who does this? investment that comes from China, especially in South Africa, benefit. I just want to understand that first before possibly they engage further. Okay. Eric? Yeah. So uh, who does it benefit? Well, first, it must benefit the owners of the company that's making that investment. That has to be the first consideration. That's the way that capitalism works. This isn't charity. This isn't aid. They're investing in order so they can make a profit on that return to bring back to China to their investors. Okay, so that is fair. That's the way it should be because that's how that's healthy investment. But if you talk to the to the workers at the Beijing Automotive Works factory in, in Port Elizabeth, who, who, are you going to say that, that, that those investments don't benefit those workers? Are you going to say that the competition in the South African auto market now that there's two or three new brands that are bringing prices down for consumers doesn't benefit South African consumers? Are you going to say that the taxes that both those employees pay and that the factory pays and the corporate taxes paid by Beijing Automotive Works doesn't help the central government in Pretoria? So to say that, yes, is it is uh-huh. all the money getting to where it needs to be? Maybe not. But there are definite benefits from having international investment and for South Africa to be tied into the global market. Welcome. Let me just emphasize something, Mr. Mm. Okay, about these investments from China. China, for instance, in South Africa, I heard your, your guest saying we have a constitution and all that. Okay. China mostly invests especially in Africa, in unstable countries. I'll tell you why they invest in South Africa. Because they have a relationship with, uh, through BRICS. They had to create that relationship mm. through BRICS in order for them to be here. But in terms of them having a factory there in, in, in Port Elizabeth or wherever, I'm going to go back to what Didivon said. You can do that. For instance, do you know, Mr. Mudul, we can collapse the automotive industry through our platinum mining? Does your guest know that? The problem is one, we mine it with palladium, the most important component in the in the cylinders of cars. Mm. We mine them, we send them out. That's why China is here doing that now. We can do it. We can manufacture those things. That's what Tidibon is trying to say. In other words, we can invest in ourselves Mm. rather than to allow a country that doesn't care about social issues of the people. You see, I'm concerned there. Mm. But, but, but I mean, KG, with, with, with a deficit of what, 3.1% that we are, we, are, we are dealing with. Where's the money going to come from? Yeah, where's the money going to come from? We, we've got capital-intensive projects that we're going to engage in. Uh, so we want money from the West. Where are we going to get the money from? You know, Mr. Mbuli, uh, the, the program of China, that your guest said, it started 10 years ago, mm. right? Mm. So in other, and uh, uh, let me just start here, in fact. How did the apartheid era, the apartheid government, build the cities we have in the country? Well, they went to Isco. They, 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 they no, oh, got, got oh, the minerals. All, they, they sold the steel. All the minerals. Yeah. That's what they did. Mm. So what's impossible with us doing the same? Rather than calling China to come here, benefit, the same benefit we can benefit to build our own. We, it's not all about money, Mr. Mudul, in some instances. Sometimes we need policies. Okay. The apartheid government they didn't have the money when it took over from the, 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 the British. Mm. What they did, mm. they came up with policies mm. that generate money for them. Yeah. You know, 
in order for them to advance their program. Yeah. So it cannot be that we're going to wait for China to give us $100 billion. Yeah. In return, they get uh, $1 trillion. It cannot be. That, that, that's my argument, that we need a policy that can advance the interest of South Africans rather than looking west or east. At the end of the day, like I said, Mr. Mbuk, they will still come for that platinum and mm. we will benefit because they need it. And we have, believe you me, almost 75% thereof and almost 80% that we haven't mined, we haven't identified. Yeah. But in terms of production, we are the highest. And not only that, Mr. Mbuk, even in terms of diamonds, mm. you know, in mm. terms of many minerals, your mm. gold, mm. your crook, China, in fact, their interest. Actually, yeah. it's in two sectors, yeah. Yeah. the chrome sector and the platinum sector. Yeah. Because that accounts to ma- manufacturing your steel, yeah. your, 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 your cars, you know. That's how, that, that's, what interest, that's what brings their interest to South Africa. Okay, so let's, let's, let's let Eric engage you on that. I mean, uh, uh, Eric, the question yeah. is, what, what, what else could Africa do, South Africa in particular, uh, so that Africa benefits more? Uh, uh, more than more than China, who are who are really here for as 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 people are saying their self self interest or entirely self promotion. Well, and what you hear in in your caller's very thoughtful comments is the sense of frustration, and we've heard it much this morning in a lot of your calls. The theme yeah. is this frustration, the sense of powerlessness mm. that it feels like other people are controlling our destiny, and again. I bring I I want to make the connection between these emotions in South Africa and what's happening in Europe and the United States. But there's also this sense of of of, of powerlessness in in the face of globalization, that we are not in control of our own destiny. And these despotic leaders now are coming up in the U.S. and Europe saying it's their fault and they're blaming other people. And they're saying, I'm going to be the solution to your problem, which brings me back to, again, what he talked about, the way that you get. The money to filter down to the people is through better leaders and more yeah. accountable government. Yeah. That is the way. And you, you, you and your listeners all know what's going on in Pretoria. You and your listeners all know what's going on with the, with, with, with the Zuma family. You and your listeners all know that the Kabila family in Congo, in Kinshasa, for years have been pocketing billions of dollars. Mm. And we can go up and down the continent. So you're right. There needs to be better laws that force investment transparency, that force you know more accountability, that force corporate social responsibility. Because when the Chinese invest in Sweden, I assure you that the money makes it down to the people more effectively than it does in South Africa. But that's not because of the Chinese. Don't blame the Chinese on that one. That is because the regulatory environment that they operate in is done by the host government, whether that's in Stockholm or Pretoria. So at the end of the day, the Chinese are just adapting to whatever environment they're in, and they will play by those rules wherever they are. If there are no rules or those rules are bad, they will take advantage of it, as other countries will as well. The Chinese are not unique here. Mm. I mean, we, we can talk about Shell in Nigeria for, for the next hour and what they've done and what British companies have done to take advantage of the systems. And in fact, the French in Gabon wrote the laws just so that they could take advantage of them for their own oil companies and their own benefit. Mm. So I think we need to make sure that we keep this in a broader context. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to take the pressure off the Chinese or defend the Chinese. They don't need that. They can defend themselves. I just think that it's more important that we first look at ourselves in the mirror before we start looking at others. Uh, KG, wrapping it up. Yeah, last bite, Mr. Mdlule. Mm. Mr. Mdlule. Uh, the thing is, the reason I raised the, the, the argument I raised is because your, your, your guest said Chinese were like us. So if we call them neoliberals, it's an insult to them. But if the Chinese won't care if war breaks out in South Africa, then they are not sharing the same thing with us. Mm. If they know how... Uh, how how hating it is or how hateful it is mm. to exploit people. Why would they want to do the same? Why wouldn't they come and say, you know, guys, we were together in we were in this situation together. You can't continue treating people like this. So Chinese, I I don't think that ideology he has described about China holds for me. That's my concern because once you say 
we, we can't call them bad because we were in the same boat. But now they are doing the same thing to us, which was done. They are not helping us against the very same people, Mr. Magoon, mm. who were in the same boat with us. So if, if they were, say, if a China is the one, we should be undertaking missions which are undertaken by the West or the, the United States, because they understand the situation better because they were in that situation. Okay, KG, let's leave it there. L- L- yeah. Listen, I, yeah. I think the yeah. Chinese would take great offense at what KG just said, because, mm. and again, I'm just, I'm just reflecting on what, what I read and what I understand about the Chinese point of view. 54% of all new construction in Africa of infrastructure is being done and financed by the Chinese, a lot of it with Chinese loans. Chinese warships are off the coast of Somalia combating piracy so that African ships can, can, can trade more effectively uh, you know, into the Gulf. You know, tens of billions of dollars in, in medical programs are being funded in, you know, to fight Ebola as it was uh, two years ago. I mean, again, we have a good case to make here to defend the Chinese for what they're doing, and that you cannot call exploitation. So again, we go back to the beginning of our conversation. As soon as we start trending into the extremes, like we did just now, you start running into problems because you have this other side of the story that makes it very, very complicated. And there's a very, very good part of the story. The Chinese investing in telecommunications and automotive manufacturing is not exploitation. You know, it's Huawei engineers that have built much of Africa's telecommunication system in the past 10 years. But, 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 you know, also, I mean, help me understand this. When you deal with with Chinese and they're dealing with their projects, why do they employ their own people? They don't employ enough African. And there's Ah, no transfer of skills. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up. Very, very good. Very glad you brought that up. There is a myth that's out there, and it is a myth. And we have data. We have researchers, we have scholars from South Africa, from Witts University, from Stellenbosch, from you know, the best universities in, in Europe, who have been going up and down the continent looking for this idea that, number one, the Chinese are importing convict labor. That's one myth that's out there. The Chinese are importing prisoners to work on construction and infrastructure projects and whatnot. That does not exist. That is a myth. Number two, they, uh, that the Chinese employ their own more than they employ local Africans. Okay. So let's kind of take the second one because that's more important. The, the, the data all shows very, very clearly, and this is from World Bank data, this is from scholarship data, and I, we have it all over our website. So if your listeners want to look for it, ChinaAfricaProject.com. The Chinese do import labor, and that's very, very unusual compared to other foreign investors. Mm. Now, and the, there's a couple different reasons why. The, so, and again, there's no simple reason. So, for example, on the standard gauge railway, uh, in Kenya that's connecting, they were having very difficult time hiring Kenyan workers from the cities to live out in the bush for six months, seven months, eight months to work. Very, very difficult time. I am not defending the Chinese. I'm simply explaining why they have been hiring, bringing in some of their local workers. Mm. So they couldn't actually hire locals to work under the conditions in the bush for six to eight months at a time. Mm. It was very, very hard because it's extremely hard work. Mm. So they brought in work. They brought in some Chinese workers there. They'll bring in Chinese workers in some instances because the each country, the host country, sets the timeline for the projects. Oftentimes, they set the budget and they set the timeline. Those are not determined by the Chinese. Actually, it's determined by the host government. So, for example, when I was living in Kinshasa, Joseph Kabila. He had the Cinq Chantier, the five major construction projects that were funded by the Chinese, but he set the timelines, and he wanted it done before the election, which was an incredibly short timeline. So it simply was not possible to meet the timeline and to train the workers necessary on the technical skills to use the equipment in time to meet Kabila's deadline. So in that case, they brought in some workers. So, so there are instances where the Chinese are bringing in workers, but what happens is the visualization of seeing Chinese laborers on road projects mm. when you have local employees, local people who are unemployed, is just so offensive to people that mm. they then take that and they stretch it out to all Chinese projects. Mm. The research indicates that about 10 to 15 percent of all the labor is Chinese on projects, which makes it about 85 percent to be local labor. Most of that 10 to 15 percent now is mostly technical and skilled labor that they can't find locally. Engineers, civil architects, whatnot, civil engineers, uh, technical positions. Mm. So that is that is what the data says. But the perception 
the perception is so offensive to people that it sticks in their mind and they can't get it out. But it, the data doesn't actually support the reality. No, it doesn't support the perception. KG, we're going to leave it there, man. I've got to push because of time. All right. No, sharp, Madrid. Sharp, thank you, my brother. Mpo in Pretoria, um, your final caller on this one. Good morning. Hey, how is it, Mr. Mazzelli? Yes, sir. Welcome. Yeah, you know, this thing of uh, globalization, international trade, is very, very much interesting. Because mm. if you look at the Chinese, the way they are positioned in uh, global international trade affairs, their uh, capacity is uh, boosted by the fact that, no, China, the input cost in China, are very, very low. Mm. Hence, uh, many Western uh, factories uh, exported uh, their, uh, what they could uh, produce, you know, imported what they could produce locally to the mainland China. Mm. And then I just like to ask your guest there to tell me what does he think of uh, IP, IPDD, something like that. Is it IPDD? But I'm sure he knows about it. What does he think about yeah. it? Well, you know, IPTV is, you know, the dream for many developing countries that don't have the broadcast infrastructure kind of set up so that they can use Internet. So it's Internet protocol television to disseminate. No, 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 no. no. Oh, is that what you're not doing? No, 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 no. That one is it IPTV whereby you find that they're actually mostly based in Holland because Holland okay, then has... then I'm not sure. Uh, what are we talking about? So, okay, so, let, me, yeah? let me explain it. To, yeah. to you because Holland has the most uh, economic parities with uh, has uh, most economic parities worldwide. Hence, the IPDD is concentrated in Holland. IPDD, in essence, is that uh, it gives international companies the right to sue the host country when they invest. Like, let me give you for example. If let's say, like he's saying, uh, let's say a, a company from the West, let's say uh, from Germany, if we BMW uh, invests uh, in the Rosling plant here in Pretoria, and then no, they let us know their uh, investment is going to be under threat due to political instability, which will fluctuate the currency and vary the entire yeah. cost. They have the right to take that. that the domestic host country to the IPDD and and so I got it. And so earlier, South Africa was cancelling most of this uh, uh, investment relations with many European countries. People didn't understand why South Africa was doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Now, how? What does Wakes think about it? Because it's still there. It's still happening out there, especially so here. In Africa, Latin America, yeah. and uh, okay, Paul, let's 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 let, him, let's yeah. let Eric answer. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, this relates. In fact, just this week on our podcast, we interviewed an expert on bilateral investment treaties (BITs), uh, and this is the these are these investment treaties that allow companies to kind of take actions to court uh, in a in a international court to basically adjudicate against you know either a government or some unfair competition. What our guest was saying that the research in Africa is that a lot of African countries engage in bilateral investment treaties with, say, the Chinese, mm. but they're never enforced. This comes back to our governance issue that we talked about earlier in the program. Mm. So you can have all the treaties, all the protocols, all the regulations, but if they're not enforced or if they're susceptible to corruption, then it doesn't really matter. And okay. what we're finding out with these bilateral investment treaties is that they're on the books in many countries, and people can sue Chinese companies, people can sue, and Chinese companies can take them to, to court to sue governments and to sue, uh, just as you've talked about. But if either the companies and the governments don't care, which is what apparently seems to be the case, according to the research and our guests that we interviewed this week on the show, yeah. then it doesn't really matter. Paul, let me let me put it uh, to you, Demi. The reason that uh, I was mentioning this point is that uh, most of the African countries they walk blindly into this investment treaties, not being aware of the right. things attached on that. And then the fact that the South Africa relies on uh, international countries to invest uh, locally, actually, it is a how can I say it? It's a Jurassic Park ideology thing of globalization. 
let me tell you why I think of this in each country, according to me. Should use its resources to produce what it can produce for its people because globalization is a good concept, mm. you know. Mm. But it has been corrupted over time because it allows uh, international countries uh, to actually to get involved, especially in uh, the politics of the host country, and that is a dangerous. You look at China, what is doing in Africa. Ne? China seems to be investing a lot of money in Africa mm. in return for what? The proper military junders. Let me give you an example of uh, this is situation of uh, your, your very Mosovene. Your very Mosovene has been in, in power for how long? Almost like Mugabe. Mm. But uh, investment flow in, in that country. You look at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, they have got they, they disregard the law. There's no human rights, but uh, they trade with the British, they trade with the Americans, the, the, the Caribbean different. So this is a fallacy that no, for investment to flow in a country, the country should be welcome, and that's a fallacy. You know, mm. for investment to flow in the country, what's been now is that that uh, what does the country that invest benefit? Mm. What's in for that country? Do you think mm. that no, a country should be should, should, should just stability? That just textbook economics. It yeah. doesn't apply here. Yeah. No, yeah. you know. Yeah. No, but let, right? let's let's leave it there, man. I get it because I'm pushed for time as well. All right. Okay, I'm really fantastic. Thank you so much. That's some Paul in Pretoria, uh, uh, Eric as well. Let me thank you. It was just enjoyable. I really yeah. enjoyed it. So so so, thank so much you. information. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Fantastic. All right, Eric Orlander there. Uh, he is the co-host of a weekly China in Africa podcast and the co-founder of the China Africa Project. We'll podcast this conversation as well, uh, and we'll give you Eric's uh, details on, on on that. And you can you can continue to listen to to more of what they're they're putting out there. Does it make it harder for you to characterize the relationship? as good or bad um or have you made up your mind uh, the growing presence of china in south africa uh partly changing the reality of um uh the 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 current infrastructure setup right that, that that is changing quite drastically but yeah i mean they're here for themselves they are here uh they're not going to interfere in 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 the laws of the country they don't um believe that uh, aid is is the way to go that model doesn't work for them and that's those are some of the reasons why they are here are you convinced uh, is it harder for you to make a decision you can give me a shout on 0861 tweet as i am tabum Juli at power fm 987 mulifi shabalala author of the book uh, the thoughts of uh, an ordinary person is that what it is the thoughts of an ordinary she just left me like that. <laughs> All right, we'll speak to Malifi after the break. Let's take a break. Power 98.7 Podcasts.